handsomely menacing gentleman, tall, dark, with a natural sophistication that made him a movie heartthrob. Stuart Granger is one of the most legendary romantic bad boys that history has ever recorded. The film star is no doubt among British leading actors in the 1940s, and his fame was cemented in Hollywood. He achieved super greatness as an ideal cinema symbol. Do they say he had a reputation for being difficult to work with? His talent was indeed saleable to his generation. Was Stuart Granger a perfect replacement for Cary Grant? A reminiscence of Stuart Granger's dashing attraction and the vigour with which he plays his gig tells you of a man who is a master in his game, not with the humour and the arrogance that he adds together to showcase the romantic passion that endeared him to young people. Rising to enormous fame in the British cinema with huge teenage fans, Granger soon navigated Hollywood in style and secured his status as one of the greatest swashbucklers and remarkably with his movie role in Scaramouche. While Stuart Granger's career was shining, he was not always in the news for the right reason. Just like the famous Marlon Brando or Warren Beatty, maybe the saying that good or bad news adds to entertainment fame will suffice. Stuart Granger's creativity is not limited to acting because he also had a flair for writing. A writer once described his entire career life as hilariously heartbreaking, hair-raising and always completely candid amidst his stormy private life. This finest English talent became a household name following his steady rise to fame in the romantic stage shows of the 1940s and not too long Hollywood with their eagle eye already spotted him and had opened its arms to receive a rare icon in a move that gave much merited international stardom. Granger was among the leading four stars who became extraordinarily famous, being a product of the Gainsborough Studios, managed by Morris Ostra, others being Margaret Lockwood, James Mason and Phyllis Calvert. With a career that has influenced several generations, Stuart Granger is one talent that is practically admired. He has continued to inspire many new talents to be ready and willing to act and say whatever studios ask them to. He was also very conscious of the gossip media who suspected he had a secret side. So Granger explored the industry in style and became very exceptional among actors of his kind, enjoying wealth and popularity. I heard Granger is a man who admires loyalty and friendship so much and pursued them above other things, a unique persona that made him even more charming in the entertainment industry. What else can I say of a man who distinguished himself as a remarkable fiction character, a man that came into the British entertainment scene as a romantic lead when almost all the really interesting melodramatic roles in the industry were being dominated by famous James Mason and secured a place for himself. Interestingly, this endowed heartthrob came into the industry as James Stewart and discovered that the name has already been taken by a more popular actor, so he decided to adopt Stuart Granger. After all, there's nothing in a name if not for identity. Already inspired to entertain humanity, Granger began an acting career with the Old Vic Company in 1939, but like most young men of his generation, World War II presented an initial obstacle to his nurturing career. He quickly followed a part to service by enlisting in the British Army, initially in the Gordon Highlanders, before he was transferred to the Black Watch. Although personal issues made him unfit for real-time battle, Granger suffered acutely from stomach ulcers and after about three years of a regimented life he came out, and as we now know, a new movie star was born in him. Granger came in to fill the inherent gap in the protagonist persona in Britain in the era, and with the right enthusiasm he pursues bigger and juicier roles, both on stage and in the movies. Born James LeBlush Stewart in 1913, Stuart Granger stylishly became a screen hero in the romantic genre, in a career that spanned up to the early 1960s. A native of West London and the only son of Major James Stewart and Frederica Lablache, Granger attended Epsom College and the Webber Douglas Academy of Dramatic Art, where he got himself tutored for theatrical greatness. Stuart Granger grew up in Bournemouth, where his mother owned a house. 
As I said earlier, he decided to alter one of his names so it does not clash with the famous American James Stewart, who was already a known star at the time, though it seems close friends and family members still refer to him as Jimmy. With his kind of greatness, one would think that he began from the top, but that is not the case because young Granger made his movie debut as an extra in the 1933 The Song You Gave Me, and had a brief scene in Give Her a Ring. The following year he was in Over the Garden Wall and A Southern Maid. These productions were like a preparatory class for this great actor where he briefly defined his typecast. As he later acknowledged, Granger lacked dedication at this time. Maybe I should say that he was acting for the fun of it, owing to his noble and financially well-to-do background. Years of stage drama, which he began at Hull Repertory Theatre, saw young Granger relocate to Birmingham Repertory Theatre following an alleged salary dispute. Was this an early sign of being a difficult person? I learned that young Granger had an early dream of becoming a medical doctor, but just like many of his kind, handsome Granger found himself busier with performing arts than his studies. A story was told of how a friend told him that he could become a film extra since he owned a car and a nice set of wares, and very funny and interesting too, to begin his career journey earning a guinea a day. Maybe the well-deserved scholarship at the Webber Douglas Art School had cemented his interest in acting, to which he later went to the theatre for an internship. At the Malvern Festival, Granger played Magnus in the apple cart, which earned the endorsement of its author, George Bernard Shaw, and other critics leading to his London stage debut at Drury Lane in a brief musical adaptation of Sanders of the River, titled The Sun Never Sets. I still recall Granger reminiscing how he had to learn from his audience, learning on the job, especially timing on stage. It was at Birmingham that Granger met Elspeth March, a leading actress with the company, who soon became his wife. He met the actress while he was playing in Serena Blandish, alongside Vivian Lee. The two fell in love and decided to cement it in matrimony. Months after his marriage to March, Granger got his first major movie role. He became the romantic lead in So This Is London. Not too long, the couple starred together in a series of plays in Aberdeen, like Hay Fever and Arms and the Man. Before war interrupted his acting career, Granger had been a member of the Gordon Highlanders and earned an endorsement, but was regrettably left behind because of his ulcer, and by the time he returned to the stage he did double supporting roles before being drafted to play the role of Maxim de Winter in the legendary London stage production of Rebecca. During this period, he was also screen-tested for The Man in Grey. The flowery Regency melodrama became a huge success and said to have established a pattern that Gainsborough Pictures would follow for several years, and of course making young Granger a superstar. Critics say he became an instant success, and before the release of that production, talented Granger had secured a contract with the studio and played in an unemotional tribute to the nursing profession, The Lamp Still Burns, as the love interest of nurse Rosamond John. Granger is at this time coasting toward greatness, as he appeared again alongside the famous Calvert and Mason in Fanny by Gaslight, which was also a Gainsborough hit. He was described by analysts as an independent-minded fellow who spoke his mind on issues about his career. Just like Mason, he was honest about his dislike for the film roles he was playing, it seems Stuart Granger would prefer the villainous roles the like of Mason was playing to the protagonist part he was doing because he thought they were more adventurous. Was it why they said he became so difficult to work with? He spoke disrespectfully about two of his scripts. When Granger played in the legendary Madonna of the Seven Moons, where he recreated a Romany gypsy who wooed a poignant hoyden depicted by Calvert, a society matron with a double personality. The impact was so huge that the song Granger rendered labelled Rosanna became a hit song. Talking about the movie, Granger said as terrible as the film is to him, it provided the escapism people needed. I still recall a media report describing Granger as a young man worth watching because the audience likes his dark looks and his scurry. That production ranked second most popular film at the British box office in 1944. 
At some point in his fame it became almost certain that Hollywood would bring him in, and that was what happened in 1950 when MGM gave Granger a Hollywood contract that saw him appear in a series of swashbuckling performances. Of course, Granger knew that international fame would be easily achieved within Hollywood, so he was delighted when MGM Studios gave him a leading role in King Solomon's Mines, a production that was partly filmed in Africa and a very unique adaptation of H. Ryder Haggard's adventure classic, with Granger driving the protagonist's role with his dashing look as the heroic Alan Quatermain. The movie ensures Granger hit the ground running in Hollywood, but reports say he delayed signing a long-term contract with the studio and lost the lead in Quo Vardis. And by the time he became convinced that the long contract is worth the trouble, Granger was placed in another legendary production, but this time it was a nervously comic adaptation of Kipling's Soldiers 3, followed by a trivial comedy thriller, The Light Touch. And in no time Granger was all over the screen shining. He also married actress Jean Simmons in 1950. The couple owned a house in San Fernando after she found herself in Hollywood. As her yet-to-be-expired contract with Rank was brought over by the famous Howard Hughes, some issues came. Her association with Hughes soon led to a legal tussle because while Granger was filming Salome alongside Rita Hayworth, he and his wife filed litigation against powerful Hughes, who had insisted that he had actress Simmons under personal contract for seven years. Even when no one gave them a chance against the movie mogul, the couple went home victorious, as the judgment was in their favour, and Simmons had to feature at MGM in Young Best that year alongside Granger, Charles Lawton and Deborah Carr, a movie Granger would later adjudge as his best Hollywood movie. Granger's first marriage with March produced two children, Jamie and Lindsay, who lived with their father and stepmother for several years. As his appeal in the industry takes a downturn, Granger would live to regret a role that he lost following what I called a wrong decision. Some would say it's part of his reputation of being hard to deal with. After Granger's pal Tracy asked director George Cooker to fix Granger in as a perfect replacement for Cary Grant, for the role of Norman Maine in A Star Is Born, Granger displayed an attitude that took the role away from him. The first choice, Cary Grant, had declined the offer, and Granger auditioned alongside Judy Garland at Cooker's home. The director had maintained a choice to offer advice on each vocal inflection, which did not go down well with Granger, as he was reported to have walked out of the production process. That role, however, became the turning point for his British friend James Mason's Hollywood career, although he later expressed remorse for not doing the role. Observers say it would have been Granger's best moments to play the role. Though Granger would later work with Cooker on Bowani Junction, a remarkable attempt to recreate John Master's novel that deals with anti-imperialist India. After which he would take solace in his lifelong friendship with his co-star Ava Gardner because the movie brought less joy to him. Cooker was disapproving of his impute. I wanted Trevor Howard. Granger was just a movie star. Cooker was quoted to have said. From that moment on, things went south for the actor as he found himself playing in less important films for the studio. It was obvious that they would not renew his contract. I hear that Granger also turned down the role of Masala in Ben-Hur simply because he was billed below Charlton Heston. He felt that it was a stab in his personality. He kept himself high on the ladder, refusing to play as a character actor at the age of 43. His wife's career was soaring high at this time, while his Hollywood career was fast dwindling. Whether a hit or a miss, Granger modestly praised his wife's talents when he said, I know I haven't a nutshell of talent compared to my wife, Jean Simmons. Their romantic journey had begun back in Britain when Granger's popularity was at its peak as one of the best leading men. He had first met the beautiful young starlet Jean Simmons on the set of Caesar and Cleopatra. They liked each other. Somehow Granger starred with the rising young star in Adam and Evelyn, after which the two fell deeply in love. A year or so dragged by before billionaire movie mogul Howard Hughes got interested in the young beauty and decided to bring her to his team of actresses. Reports say Hughes flew Granger and Simmons to Tucson, Arizona via his private jet 
and they cemented their romance in matrimony. It was within this period that MGM offered Granger the lead in King Solomon's Mines, when Errol Flynn refused to play the role. The couple had been in romantic heaven in their marriage, but excessive career engagement would become an issue, and leading to a long separation, with Stuart Granger returning to Europe for a fresh career start. Their career strain may have eventually severed their union, which they officially ended in 1960, the same year Granger played his last notable movie role in Henry Hathaway's boisterous comedy adventure, North to Alaska, which he did with John Wayne. If you thought his story was captivating, get ready for an even juicier revelation. In our next video, we delve into the secret life of Florence Henderson, the scandalous truth about America's mom.